as far as your marriage with James Addy, can you describe it for the jury? Um, it was good sometimes. It was bad sometimes. I thought we both tried to make it work. I thought we both tried. So in April of 2018, were you still married uh, to Mr. Addy and living in that same home? Yes. Did you have any idea that your husband was using this cell phone to communicate with his girlfriend? No. Until the early morning hours of April 28th of 2018, did you have any idea your husband was having an affair? No. Do you remember what he was wearing when he left? Um, blue jeans, a black jacket, and boots. After the ev evening of April 27th of 2018, did you ever find that jacket? No. Did you look for that jacket? Yes. We see this car in the garage in this photo. Uh, is that normally where that car was parked? Um, no, he would usually park it outside the garage. To your knowledge, was he working on the car that evening? No, not that I know of. After your, the police came and spoke with your husband that night uh, and left, did you start looking around the house? The next day, yes. Why is that? Um, I just wanted to see if there was anything else that I could find. Did you find something? I, I did, in the garage. Is that the same garage that that maroon car was parked in? Yes. And uh, what was in that loft area? Um, I found some boxes of things that had belonged to Molly. Um, I found a locked chest that when I opened it had a, a photo album. So Mr. Addy went on at least two trips uh, without you, is that right? Correct. Did you ever go on trips without Mr. Addy? Yes. Did you have conversations with Mr. Addy about those trips? Yes. Okay, what, what, if anything, did he tell you about you going on trips? He didn't want me to travel without him. Why was that? He assumed I would have an opportunity to have an affair. Were you divorced from Mr. Addy in October of 2017? No. Did you have any idea that your husband of 22 years signed a form that said you were? No. Did you have any idea that that form was a marriage license to marry another woman? No. Were you in a horrible car crash a few months after that divorce date in October of 2017 around Christmas or New Year's? No. And is it fair to say you did not pass away in April of 2018? That's correct. Wow. You know, I looked at looking at her eyes, so sad, so sad. And, and think about two women's lives who are destroyed here. You're talking about, of course, Molly is dead, and that's what this trial is about, to figure out if James Addy is responsible for that murder. But then you have Melanie Addy, who is, is you know, I can't imagine. It's a, almost a quarter century married, raising children in a family and leaving, living this separate life. If you're not happy, get a divorce. Just be honest about it. All right, let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae, who's been covering this for us uh, all day long. Uh, Julia, this is a big moment uh, because she's in there and she's giving information. And, she's, and she doesn't have that air of, you know, I'm trying to get him. She doesn't have that spite. She just looks uh, sad, uh, a little brokenhearted, um, really, you know, not happy to be there, but speaking what seems to be the truth. And every little piece of the truth here is part of this case against her ex-husband. She just seemed hurt on the stand. Still, three years later, after the divorce, it seemed like it's still fresh and raw for her, like she was walking through and living, reliving those moments of finding out that everything that she thought about her marriage and her relationship was a lie. She was there on the stand. It seemed like she was holding back tears the entire time. She was holding tissue in her hand and just focusing on the prosecutor while she was answering those questions. Uh, but I think she came across as a very credible witness, not someone who was vindictive. She didn't even say anything that seemed particularly damaging about the defendant, but just walking people through what she learned as she learned it. 
Yeah, a, a lot of credibility. You know, there, there could be some exes that could come inside a courtroom and they might seem a little spiteful trying to get back at them and may, you know, try to puff things up a little bit, make them look worse. That's not the, the feeling or vibe I got from her, which, which makes her an effective witness. But at the end there, those questions that were asked by the prosecutor, were you in a car accident? Uh, did you die? Uh, were important questions because of some other testimony. Um, and here you have the prosecutor who's reading an email from Molly to the wedding planner. And, and this is fascinating. Let's take a listen. So I spoke with James, and we're just going to have to kind of wing it. And I hope he's able to make it, I think. His ex-wife, kid's mother, passed over the weekend after a car accident at Christmas. So he is all over the place helping his kids through this and taking care of things for them, as well as the wedding. And then she asks you if you'd be able to plan that meeting the following day. Uh, and this email is dated Sunday, April 22nd, so it looks like she's trying to plan uh, for Monday, April 23rd. And then she offers Tuesday, so Tuesday, April 24th. Is that right? Correct. You know, Julia, I, I can't tell you how many trials I've covered through the years where similar things have taken place, where there's this communication uh, from the husband um, to the girlfriend about his wife or ex-wife dying, um, but usually the wife or ex-wife ends up dead. In this trial, it's the, the girlfriend who ends up dead. That's what makes this one a little bit different than the other love triangles. And, and, and um, I think, it, it's, I don't know if that helps the defense or hurts the defense, because you know, the normal thing is I'm moving on to a new woman. I don't want to get a divorce, so I kill my wife. But here, he doesn't move on with the new woman. He's apparently, um, well, she dies, so he can't move on with her. But he's still telling people that his wife's dead. He's telling his girlfriend, apparently his fiance, that his wife is dead. It, it is strange that we're hearing this kind of back and forth and wondering if it's something where he's panicking. He's wondering, what am I going to do? How am I going to explain? Once this wedding happens and all of these guests come to the wedding and wonder where my family is, where my kids are, uh, it, there's actually two dates in that email that I think are important. That email is in April. He's saying that his ex-wife was uh, died over the weekend in April, but saying that she actually got in a car accident around Christmas. So if that's what Molly Watson is understanding, it, it could suggest that he's been telling her that his wife is critically ill for four months um, length of time. And it could be him trying to figure out how he's going to reconcile these two lives and perhaps not even knowing what direction this is going to take if he in fact was involved with the murder of Molly Watson. And, there, and there's such a simple lesson from all of this. Like the, the more you lie, the digger you deep the hole, the hole and it just becomes impossible to get out of. You can't explain it anymore. And, and that, that seemingly is what happened here. Uh, but the question again is, did he commit murder? And was that one way to get out of all this? Now, there was another big moment today inside the courtroom involving the daughter of James Addy, who also testified. Uh, she's now uh, 20 years old. Uh, let's take a listen. That evening, Dad said he was going to go meet a friend, and he left. And I think a couple of hours later, Mom went to bed, and I was still up doing homework at around 10 p.m. And that's when, that's around the time that Dad came home. Um, he asked me what I was still doing up, and I just told him I was turning in homework. And um, he walked out. And then a little bit after that, I finished and got up and went to go brush my teeth. And uh, while I was brushing my teeth, he came to the bathroom and just stood at the doorway and then walked back out. When you were in the bathroom that night, how did your dad act while he was waiting for you? Um, he looked just really antsy about it, about it, I don't know. And do you remember um, if your dad did any laundry that night? Yes, uh, it was when I walked out of the bathroom and through the dining room, uh, I heard the washing machine going. 
And did you smell anything? Yes, I smelled bleach. Amazing composure. I can't imagine at such a young age and being, you know, in the middle of all this as the child of this defendant, uh, being able to get in court and testify, but she was able to do that today. And uh, James Addy uh, broke down a little bit when she entered the courtroom. He did. As soon as her name was called as the next witness, you saw the biggest showing of emotion that we've seen from the defense table in this trial. He could not hold back those tears as she approached the stand. He pulled off his glasses and was dabbing his eyes with tissue. And that solemn demeanor really continued throughout her testimony. She testified that she was close to her dad at this time. They were friends. They got along. And that's what she considered. She was a junior in high school at this time and never suspected anything out of the ordinary before. And again, going back to all these other trials that I've covered, many times the children are stuck in the middle because usually uh, one parent is dead, usually mom, dad is on trial for the murder, and they, you know, their feelings are just kind of caught in the middle of all this. Here, mom is still alive and she had to testify, and, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, what she thinks, and, and obviously, you can't ask that question on the stand, but that's, I mean, it, it's torture uh, for this young woman. Now, uh, she also testified about an important piece of evidence, which is a, a T-shirt uh, that was found at the scene. Let's listen. Do you recognize that shirt? Yes. Right. How do you recognize that shirt? Um, there was a contest in my graphic design class um, that we had to go to and we had to print certain designs on the t-shirt a certain way and um, everybody in the class did theirs correctly. I'm the only one who messed up very bad so okay. I, I know that's my shirt. And that shirt is found at the scene. So this is, a, this is a direct connection between someone from the Addy household and, and the crime scene. Found at the scene with the victim's DNA on it. We learned that yesterday when the DNA criminologist was on the stand. They tested it because it was found near the body, found with the cell phone of the victim. But it's unclear if she was wearing it, if someone else was wearing it, if it was in her car but only that it had the DNA of Molly Watson and the DNA of James Addy was excluded as a possible match for what was found on that shirt. All right, a lot of important testimony today. Things are moving fast inside that courtroom. Uh, Julie Janae, thank you so much, and, and, and we'll talk again. Thanks, Benny. All right, folks, when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about another case that we're covering uh, out of Cal City in California, two toddlers, Orson and Oren, three and four years old, go missing in December. Where are they? Where did they go? We'll take a, a closer look at some of the clues, some of the facts, the investigation, uh, to try to get to the bottom of it. That's right now. That's coming up next.